New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the topic of recalling your past life memories. My guest is Dina Miriam, who began work on the interfaith movement in the 1990s as vice chair of the Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious Leaders held at the United Nations in 2000. She is the founder of the Global Peace Initiative of Women. For over 40 years, she has been a student of Paramahansa Yogananda's Kriya Yoga and a meditation practitioner. She received a master's degree from Columbia University. In 2014, she received the Niwano Peace Prize for her interfaith peace efforts. She states that her books, written in novel form, are nevertheless based on past life memories, and they include My Journey Through Time, a spiritual memoir of life, death, and rebirth, The Untold Story of Sita, and When the Bright Moon Rises. Her most recent book is to dance with the Dakinis in search of self. Dina lives on the East Coast, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Dina. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You've been a practitioner of Kriya Yoga, the yoga taught by uh, the Spiritual Realization Fellowship, Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, I presume you've been a practitioner now for many decades. Many decades, since I was 20, which is a long time ago. And I know now you've written these novels, they, at least they read like novels, uh, which you say are based on your actual experiences, your, your past life recall. It reminds me of a whole series of books. I wonder if you're familiar with Joan Grant wrote a, a series called the Far Memory series about her past lives. I don't know that. The Far, what is it called? Far Memory. Far Memory, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. When did she, I, I have to look that up. I try not to read too much else. Um, when I'm writing, so is I, that I stay very focused on what I need to say, what I need to bring out. Well, I guess I think the fact that you're not familiar with Joan Grant's books, uh, which I think were written in the 1940s, uh, 1950s, maybe even the 1930s, but uh, that adds maybe a, a little uh, weight on the side of authenticity for your own work. Uh, but it is the case, I, I guess it's fair to assume that as a, a writer, and you, I think, it, say, say as much in uh, your newest book, that you, there's a degree to which you take poetic license in order to help the story flow. Exactly. I mean, um, you know, to me, the, 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 what I hope comes through are the teachings that, that, that were given to me and the details are less important. And so, in other words, if you're writing a story, you want to put yourself in that context. What was happening in that place? What did it look like? So you have to add some detail. And that's where the poetic license comes into filling in the context. So you really feel you're back in 12th century Tibet. Um, because my memories, and I think when we, we, we have our memories there of our own life, not necessarily of what was going on on the bigger scale, right? But of course, you know, um, all those things affected us, but you're very much sort of engrossed in your own life struggles. Um, and so that's where the poetic license comes, filling in the context. This is what Tibet was like in the 12th century. 
and I gather, uh, in fact, I think you even cite the authors who, whose work you used in researching 12th century Tibet and the other historical periods about which you've written. Right, uh, because you know, I, I, when I'm when I'm trying to understand what I'm seeing, and so I go back and try to learn a little bit of what was going on at that time. And I also wanted to give something of the history because not a lot of people realize that Tibet was a great empire and was one of the large empires of the time, actually, uh, in the 8th century. And there were things that happened where Tibet turned its attention away from outer conquest to inner conquest. A lot, Many things were happening at that time. There was the great Guru Rinpoche and, uh, uh, you know, different forces were at play. That, that where they were losing territory and divisions uh, erupted. And, and one of the divisions was between the traditional culture of Bun and Buddhism, which was coming in at the 8th century. And that really played out in the character's life, this tension between these the, the new religion and the older religion. Even though Buddhism was not new, it was it was it was relatively new to Tibet, and it was becoming the religion of Tibet. Um, but there was this ancient tradition, and what ended up happening is an integration of the two, which we can, from our perspective today, uh, appreciate. They're very well integrated, but in that era, uh, you have. I gather direct memories of the struggle that uh, you went through in a past life dealing with the changes that were taking place centuries ago. Because there was a suppression of, of bone, uh, and, you know, a lot of it was um, nature, you know, nature based. Uh, uh, and actually, Tibetan Buddhism still incorporates a lot of that. There are rituals for the, for the elements, and, and uh, they deal with. Uh, um, in many of the elements, that's why it's become an integration. But yes, as a, as a as a young woman living at that time with one parent following Buddhism and one parent following Bun, I I had to tr learn to integrate them in my own life. It took a whole lifetime to do that. Well, it would be a wonderful story if you were a historian and a historical novelist, but you're claiming, and, and I take you at your word, that you're writing these books not from the perspective of, of a historian, but from the perspective of a uh, yoga practitioner who has recovered memories. I'm writing the book from that point of view, except I think that history... What is history is every, every person's story. I mean, people who live during the time of an historical event would each see it differently, right? Because their experience is different. So we each would tell the history of a time period based on our own experiences. A history, a historian just deals with the outer facts, battles that took place, borders that changed, the line of kings that came in, just with the outer facts. Not what the people were necessarily going through and struggling with. Well, I have been studying reincarnation for a long time. I have an actual degree in parapsychology, and I find the field fascinating. We've done dozens of interviews on this channel about uh, the topic of reincarnation, but it's very rare to find a person such as yourself who claims to have vivid past life memories of multiple lives like that. It's, it's quite uncommon. And so I'm very interested in how that evolved for you. You know, it, 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 um, my first book, My Journey Through Time, which I wrote, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, I, I had been sitting with memories. So I had fleeting visions, as many people do, in things, I knew I lived there, I knew I knew this person, I see myself there. But when I was in my 40s, uh, someone came into my life that shook me awake, and I began to recall so many details of the birth just previous to this. It, there was a lot of trauma in that birth, <laughs> because I was born in Russia and was sent out during the revolution and then was in Europe during the, the uh, World War II. A lot of trauma in that life. And yet, that was the life that I met my guru, because he was passing through, going back to India at the time that I was 
also in Europe. He passed through Germany, and I happened to be there. And that was my connection with him, just a brief meeting when he gave a talk. Everything made sense to me, but I was married for many years to a psychiatrist, the head of psychiatry at a major hospital. So, of course, I doubted myself. You know, am I imagining this? So I began to research. This is where my research began. I went to the places. I went to the place in Prague where I saw that I had died, where I remember the Nazis marching in from the left of my apartment where I stood at the window. I went to that place and indeed saw the, the avenue. Then I went to St. Petersburg where I thought I'd been born and, and, and the ballet school where I had studied. I, I actually was like a detective. And there were many, many things that happened that confirmed to me that what I was seeing was real. Uh, and I, I've not done that since. I mean, now I just take, take it as a given. And I say to myself, if I don't have all the details right, does it really matter? The important thing is I'm learning, I'm coming to understand the law and cause and effect. To me, it was never a curiosity thing. Oh, I was this person or that person. I want to understand this law of cause and effect. I want to understand the connection between lives and, 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 and see, and then when you step back, so in the first book, I went back, I don't know, six or seven lives. And it happened over a period of seven years, maybe. Each life was stimulated by going to a place or meeting a person. And then it was like the door opened and I was flooded with images. And I just was taking it all in, trying to make sense of it. When I put it together, it was such a beautiful mosaic. And I thought, this is incredible. And this is just one person. Every person has this mosaic where, where, where things that don't get fulfilled in one life get fulfilled, could be three lifetimes later. But if you look at it as one life, not multiple lives, everything comes to fruition. And the things that you don't get to work out, your tendencies that you're not happy with, you get opportunities in the future to work them out. Would you say that your practice of uh, Kriya Yoga had enabled uh, these memories to come through? I totally attribute it to that. <laughs> I don't know what else to attribute it to. <laughs> you know, I think it's, um, I mean, Kriya is a very powerful practice. Uh, it works with the, with the prana, uh, the Kundalini prana. And, uh, where are the seeds of our memories stored? You know, our seeds, we, everything is stored. We're just not conscious of it because how I, the first time my memories emerged, it was very destabilizing. I was newly divorced, well, not newly, but I was divorced, raising two teenage sons, keeping a job to support them, uh, having to, you know, manage my job and my, my family, and finding myself in, in 1930s Europe with Nazi sirens going on. And it was very destabilizing. If I didn't have my practice, it would have been very hard. And it took me a long time to learn how to live in multiple time periods so that I could absolutely be talking to you and conducting my life and be remembering something far away at another time and not find it at all uh, uh, unnerving. I gather at this point you have memories for over a dozen different past lives. Yes, that's true. Over over a dozen. And I and I've been able to sequence them. So because again, I was looking to understand the patterns. Yeah. And 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 because if you can understand you if you if you understand how your past has created the circumstances for your present, then you can begin to shape your future. And so my whole energy now is toward the future, shaping my future, because I think I've come to understand that one has to live a little bit more mindfully and, and, and consciously create the future, not be, not just be tossed around by, um, you know, unworked out feelings and emotions and, and habits, but you can consciously create the future that you want. Uh, and, 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 and so the book I'm working on now is called Memories of a Future Life. <laughs> it's 200 years in the future. <laughs> it's, 
difficult book. <laughs> I've heard of Future Memory. My friend Phyllis Atwater, PMH Atwater, has a book out on that title. She would suggest that the future isn't so different from the past and that, uh, you know, according to Einstein's uh, idea of the block universe, all time exists in the now moment. Exactly. Exactly. This is my conclusion as well. I've realized, I mean, because my when I've when I've been writing, I mean, you have to understand, I actually relive those lives. I'm actually that persona again, that personality, living that life, going through those experiences. The only difference is I understand it in a completely different way. The teachings that came through went over my head. I didn't get, get it. In life after life, that was the case. But now, I'm, it's like the teachings are coming to me anew. And so that's the gift to me, is that I'm getting another opportunity to, to really hear these teachings that were given to me at an earlier time that I didn't understand. And so as I project myself into the future, and I say to myself, have I already lived this future life that I'm writing about? It seems to me I have. That's very interesting. It's a, it's a more awakened me. It's a me who knows, who knows something a little bit more than the me now. <laughs> As a student of reincarnation from a scientific point of view, I have personally taken the attitude that we don't know for sure that everybody is going to reincarnate or that everybody has had past lives. What I say from a scientific point of view, we have data on about 2,500 cases, typically young children who uh, re remember their past lives and start talking about them almost as soon as they can speak. The, the researchers are very hesitant to even include a case such as your own because they would say, as an adult, you've been exposed already to so much information that we can't be sure that you're not simply uh, remembering a, a novel you read when you were a child or something of that sort, whereas with a young child. But in any case, you seem to be of the belief that everybody has past lives and everybody will have future lives. Well, I can't say everybody. Everybody's a lot of people. I, I think that those of us, I always sort of smile to myself when I have friends in the spiritual world. I'm not coming back. It's like, well, don't you want to help? Don't you want to help the situation? <laughs> you know, you're going to sit in the spiritual world and just enjoy a, 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 a less troubled place and not come and, and be of service here. So I think that, and then most of us have karma to work out. I mean, the question has come to me, do we just reincarnate on earth or do we reincarnate on other planets? And I've said, I don't know. I don't know. I have no memory of other planets. Doesn't mean that some people won't. I just don't have personal experience of that that I can remember. I can't speak for everybody. I think that I have gotten so many uh, emails from people saying that just in reading my book, it's given them insight into their own past. And that's my hope, is that it's not to me a curiosity thing. I tell you, after, uh, after I published my book, the reason I published it, I wrote it, the first one, My Journey Through Time, for myself to look at the patterns and to see what learning there was. I was having these experiences that were very real to me, and I wanted to put them down to see what it all came, what, what came of it. And a friend of mine who was a, a, a writer and had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer asked me if she could read what I was writing. She was just starting her uh, TMs, just starting to meditate. And I, I was hesitant, but she prodded and I gave it to her. Well, it helped her deal with death. Because that's one of the things that I experienced in, in my, in remembering all this. I remember my deaths. I remember my time between births. And it was like we, we, it's instinctive in us to have this fear of death, but it needn't be like that if we understood what that process is. And so she asked me if she could share the book with others, uh, who are friends of hers who were sick. And I said, sure. So I published it because of her. And then I had shared it before I published it with a few spiritual friends. And they urged me to, to, to use a pseudonym because they said, Dina, you're, you know, you're an interfaith leader. People are going to think, you know, remember Shirley McLean and all that. 
I said, look, I'm out of the closet. There's nothing I can do. This is my life. Because I go back and forth between my gir- current life and how these things emerged. Well, a short time later, a Christian leader emailed me and said, Dean, I've just read your book. I need to talk to you. And I thought, oh, here it goes. He, I didn't respond. He was a good friend. Um, but he, he finally called me and he said, I read your book. I was so moved. I started researching the field and there's so much out there now about children. And he said, you got to read this book. I've never read a book that scientifically deals with reincarnation because I'm not looking to be convinced. But he told me about one book and another. So I did read one of the books and I was amazed at how much research is out there about children who have in- incredible memories. I saw it with my own children and grand- a grandchild. And it was my grandchild, actually, his memories of Tibet that led me to write the recent book, To Dance with Bikinis. Um, but then a Catholic priest friend of mine called me and said, Dina, I read your book. I got to talk to you. So I thought, okay. And he said, nothing in here contradicts my belief, my theology. And so I say, you know, does everybody reincarnate? Well, how can I speak for everybody? <laughs> I think a lot of us do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's very interesting, uh, your involvement in the interfaith movement. It's, it seems somehow to parallel all the past lives you've written about because they occur in different faith traditions. And underneath it all, you seem to be suggesting that all all the way through these lives, there have been teachers who represent what one might call the perennial philosophy, the, the mystical traditions that run through every culture. That's why I came to understand my current life so much more, uh, um, both my, my work in the interfaith world and my work to empower women's voices. And so I, I came to understand this uh, and I think that's the value of it. So what's the value? I mean, to me, people ask me, should I go to past life regression? I say, why? You know, anything you need to know, you're going to know. You know, things will arise organically. And what's the point of somebody telling you, oh, you were so-and-so and so-and-so, if it's not resonating in here? In other words, if you're not understanding what, what, what the purpose is to know that, why do you need to know that? So I think, I think that I've been given uh, these memories in order to share them widely so more people can access their memories and people can finally see that this is a law of the laws of the universe, cause and effect, rebirth, uh, what death is. I mean, that's a big part of it is we've need getting over our fear of death. I mean, yes, you're leaving your attachments, but relationships don't end. I mean, that's another great teaching. Relationships don't end. The people you love, you continue to love, and should they show up someplace else in your future? And often in unexpected ways. That's right. It, it, if I recall from your novel, some of the people who were adversaries become, in one lifetime, become relatives in another. <laughs> yes, that was one of the that that that's how you work through karma. Is that, yes, that's, that's the story of To Dance with Dakinis. Someone who was a son, but an abandoned son, uh, became someone who took, who, who sort of like a cult leader who took me over. And it, I spent many, many, um, much time trying to free myself of that relationship, which I eventually did. Uh, and then, uh, another one is my brother in the next life. And so, and it took a whole lifetime to make peace with him. If there are troubled relationships, you have to know there's an earlier cause. It's so interesting the way one life sort of leads into another. Uh, Traditionally, when people talk about the uh, law of karma, the principle of karma, uh, I often hear it in terms of uh, instant karma. You you do something wrong and you you get uh, immediately punished for it. The research that I'm aware of with the young children and, and so on and regarding past lives suggests that karma doesn't work that way. It's not as if you're going to be punished in one life because of the bad deeds of a preceding life. How, how does it work in your mind? Well, I do not see, I do not understand karma as a system of reward and punishment. 
that's a very sort of Abrahamic concept we have in our mind. We're, you know, we're taught that in the Abrahamic tradition. That's not the meaning of karma. Karma is, 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 is simply that everything is energy. Thought is energy. Words are energy. Action. And whatever you put out there ha- ha- leads to an effect. There's a cause and an effect. So you're putting out energy. It's a neutral system. And in some way, that has to rebalance itself. And so I see karma as a way of the universe rebalancing itself. And the process is for our awakening. So it's also patterns of behavior. If you, you know, are a lazy person in one life, well, that karma is going to follow you until you see that it's working against you. And you have to change that pattern of behavior. A pattern of thinking, if you're a very jealous person, well, that that is going to follow you until you have experiences, whatever the experiences are, and they could be a whole range, it's not one thing, that help you overcome that tendency. So it's it's things come our way to help us overcome tendencies that are blocking our progress. Patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior, and things that we do. I mean... There are some instances, I have a situation where a friend left her husband for for his best friend. 20 years later, she she married that best friend. 20 years later, he left her for her best friend. And I thought, wow, I've never seen such an exact duplication of things in one lifetime. It could have been three lifetimes later that something would happen, you know, but But she learned a great lesson through that, and so it was condensed. And so sometimes, and I think when you're making, when you're doing spiritual practice, I think things are condensed, speeded up, so that you can work through a lot of karma in one life instead of having five lifetimes to work through things. But it does seem to be the case, as as far as I know from the research, that uh, as you say, it's the habits, the tendencies, or I think sometimes the Sanskrit word is the samskaras uh, that get carried forward from lifetime to lifetime. It's the pattern, yes. I mean, we, we are constantly refining ourselves until we overcome egoic tendencies. And I think we're you know, evolving toward a more um, sort of universal mindset. We've, you know, normal life, we're very petty, right? You know, we, we, we get angry at things that are really not very important. We, we, we have these emotions that we need to outgrow if we're going to, to grow into a more awakened state of consciousness. And so things come our way that give us opportunities, to outgrow those those uh, sort of childish emotions or less evolved emotions and, and ways of behaving. And if we don't take that opportunity, which most of us don't take the first time around, it will come again, another opportunity, maybe in a different way. And if we don't take that opportunity, then we'll get a, a third opportunity that comes our way. Eventually, we'll get it. Since you are a practitioner of Kriya Yoga, to change the topic slightly, there's one thing about Yogananda and his work and his amazing autobiography that has has puzzled me quite a bit. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about Babaji. I think, in fact, I may have seen a photo of you next to a photo of Babaji somewhere on, on the – oh, it's right there, is it? There, yes, there we go. So Babaji is, uh, as I recall from the autobiography of uh, Yogananda's, is is the guru of his guru, but is a person who was alive in the physical body for thousands of years. And I w- wonder if have you had any experience or any thoughts about that. I have had experiences of Babaji, and I wouldn't say that he maintains a physical body for thousands of years. He is one of the guiding presences on earth, and he's in and out of his physical form. So he can manifest a physical form, but he can demanifest a physical form, uh, dematerialize a physical form. Um, there, there, there are people who have seen him. 
there is a place, a very remote region high up in Himalayas, where he said to spend time with a small group of disciples, and which means there are also many of them may have left the body also. So physical, non-physical. I mean, you can go back and forth between the spirit, between light body and physical body. At, at a certain level, you manifest the physical body. And if you, you know, I mean, in that picture where he's bare chested, high up 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 feet in the Himalayas, he's not feeling cold. So how physical, <laughs> how much in a body is he? <laughs> Yes, he can manifest a physical body. He's a presence. He's been around. He's one of the guiding forces that works with many of the the avatars uh, on the evolution of of our planet. Uh, you know, the Tibetans they talk about the great masters. You know, the Siddhas. Uh, there are these beings who are near to Earth um, uh, and who are spiritually guiding and helping. So Babaji would be one of these. And you indicated you have had an experience. Would I be probing too much to ask you to amplify on that? <laughs> yeah. certain, experience, certain experiences can be shared and certain can't be shared. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I have no problem with that. I, I realize that uh, some experiences aren't meant for everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've had experiences with my guruji as well, and those those I, I rarely talk about in public. Well, because if if I recall correctly, Yogananda himself died before you became in this lifetime a, a kriya yoga practitioner. That's right. He passed away before I. Yeah, yeah. But but again, he's you know his physical presence. I've learned, you know, it was at a time when many of my friends were running off to India finding their gurus. And they said, well, you need a physical presence of a guru. And I said, it's, it's an, I, he found me. It's like not like I can choose, you know. What can I do? <laughs> he left his body. But then, and it was difficult. I really yearned to be with him. And I think it's because I said I'd seen him briefly in my past birth. And I wanted to leave Europe and come to America to, to be with him, to study with him, to learn to meditate. And my mother had been a theosophist, so I had been exposed to some of the Eastern philosophy. Uh, but I was, I died. I was trapped in Europe. And, and it, it, this is in the book. As I was dying, he came to me. He, he came to, well, he came to me, um, a few years, it's all in the book, in a vision and said, I'm coming to take you to America. So I waited for Swamiji. That's what he was called, the Swamiji coming to take me to America. But I died. And, in my death, I saw him come, and he said, I've come to take you to America. And he did. He took me to take birth in America 10 years later. And so I, I found him very early on, and I knew he was my guru. As soon as I saw autobiography of his picture in the autobiography, he's the one. It triggered something. And, and I learned, had to learn to have an internal relationship with him. The external relationship, in a way, is a distraction. You get caught by the guru's personality. A lot of my friends, you know, went to Nimkroli Baba, and they were so taken with his personality. I, I didn't have that opportunity. You know, of course, I love Yogananda's personality, but he was an internal presence to me. He was not just the, the, the guy in the robe. The philosopher Henri Corbin who was a good friend of Carl Jung, wrote about his experience with a, a guru, Sura Vardi, who died, I think, in the 12th century. And he used the term imaginal to distinguish it from imagination. He said, well, you can enter into a, an imaginal relationship, which is very real. It's sort of like a, a category halfway in between imaginary and physical, that it's, it's non-physical, but it is just as real as anything that would be physical. I totally understand that. <laughs> I probably would use a different word um, because of the association of imagination. I mean, what is imagination? I think a lot of imagination is memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, nothing is created out of nothing. We, we have these memories that 
create these images for us. And, and I think a lot of novels are based on experiences that people have had in different births. But we call them novels because that's more acceptable. But I think you, there's no question in my mind that you can have relationships with non-physical beings uh, uh, because this is, uh, there are dimensions. You know, I think um, I've come to use more, more uh, modern terms, uh, you know, celestial world. What is a celestial world? There's another dimension, a, a subtler dimension uh, of, of existence. And, and I think we can have relationships with beings in the subtler worlds. There's no question about that. And you've also talked about uh, your memories of the space in between lifetimes. Uh, in the other dimensions, in those other dimensions. Yeah, researchers call that the intermission period. <laughs> well, I would say this is the intermission period. <laughs> we uh -huh. spend more time there than here. <laughs> You can you can look at it either way. That's the intermission, or this is the intermission. How interesting! This, in a way, is a death. A birth is a death. You're you're, you're relocating. So, in a way, it's a death from there. You have beings there that you're interacting with. You're not just sitting alone in your mind. You're you're having a life in that world, and then you have to leave that life to come back here. And so there's a sort of there's a there's a, a sort of sorrow in that process. It's not like oh good I'm going to be born again. It's like okay I'm going to I'm doing this. <laughs> what I take from what you've just said is that there are guides and teachers who are with you on the other plane. Yes. And and that their presence is constant from lifetime to lifetime. Yes, that's absolutely true. Yes, uh, because from a, from um, I mean, my meeting in my past birth, my just birth previous to this, with my guru was not the first. I can recount two other experiences that I had with him, and I I I, I think when when you make when you when you enter into such a relationship, it's an eternal one. It's it's not oh well goodbye. You know, we, I I did what I could in this life. It's an ongoing relationship. And similarly with other beings that you've encountered along the way, um, nobody that I've written about, and I've written five books now about different births, nobody that I've written about has moved out of my consciousness. I'm aware of them all. And, and sometimes I can feel so... so uh, there's a story in my guru's book about when he opened a school in India before he came to America, there was one of his students who passed away, and he had promised to find that student in his new birth and bring him again to the spiritual path. How did he do that? He was looking for the vibration of that soul that vibrated. His name was Kashi, and he did find him. And he spoke to the parents, and the mother was indeed pregnant with a child, and he was able to direct that child to a, to a teacher. But um, that's how I, I, you can, each soul vibrates at its own unique way, and you can identify people by that vibration. I don't know how else to describe it, but, but, but I often find myself in contact with, with, People that I encountered thousands of years ago who are very dear to me, but who I've uh, who are not physically present now. So you experience them in dreams or in meditation. Both. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in dreams, sometimes in meditation, sometimes when I'm writing. So it seems to me that the message of all of this is that we are much larger beings than. We are trained to think of, uh, especially growing up socially, we're conditioned to believe that, as Alan Watts once described us as a, a skin encapsulated ego. Uh, oh, we, we, the reality is much different. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a big change. You begin to think of yourself. Uh, in that book, To Dance with Dakinis, there are stories of of uh, of really who who are who are who are we, and at the end of my first book, my journey through time, I say, you know, am I the the, the Russian dancer or am I the Southern Belle or am I the African villager or who am I? 
Who am I? And of course, that's the ultimate question. That's it. There is really no other question. Who are we? <laughs> yeah. And I came to see all, all of it and none of it. And I began to see my own identity as just another one of those personalities. In my next birth, am I going to remember Dina and she's just going to be another one of the personalities? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, do I ident when I'm writing the books, I identify more with the characters than I do with Dina. I have to pull myself back and say, now you're Dina. Well, and it's fascinating to me that you are in the process of writing a book about a person who you were in the future. Makes total sense, too. And I think, you know, I started to talk to some of my friends who are reaching, you know, a stage in life where you, you're sort of, you're creating the the framework for the future is like, you can tell, you can see what you've not been able to fulfill. You know, we, we don't fulfill all of our aspirations. So what, what is it that you have not really been able to complete that you still have aspirations for? Uh, uh, and so you can begin to see how that might unfold. Of course, there are, there are the details, there are the details that need to be, that are not yet worked out. But the general framework, I think, if you really introspect, you can see. Because it raises a huge philosophical question. If, if you've already lived your future life, does that mean you don't have free will? That it's already happened? There's nothing you can do to uh, make it any different? But I created it. There's the relative truth and the ultimate truth. In the ultimate sense, there's no time or space. You know, uh, uh, it, you know we, 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 I mean, what is this material world but a projection from a sort of like an energetic energy, energy verse, really? Mm -hmm. So in the ultimate sense, and yet in the relative sense, we have a lineal time frame, we have a spatial frame, uh, and so we work within that. Um, and so it's, you have to operate in both. So, in, in the ultimate sense, the future is now, but in the relative sense, that lies ahead of me, and I'm going to create it. So, it's not a matter of you don't have free will, because I created it. Nobody created it for me. Just like with karma, nobody punishes you. You do it to yourself. There is nobody counting up the points, reward, punishment. Everything is self-generated, <laughs> because we want the, the, the instinct, the impulse in us is to fully awaken into our potential and who we are. And so we create scenarios for ourselves to help us awaken. Well, that's beautifully put. It, of course, raises as many questions as it answers. For example, the mystics of every culture, and I'm quite sure Yogananda stands amongst them, would say, we're one with everything. And if we're one with everything, then how how do the past lives fit in? Does that mean that that we're more one with these particular lives and than with other lives? Well, that's the difference. That's the ultimate truth and the relative truth. In the ultimate sense, it's true. I mean, sometimes I think you know, there's one book I read, the untold story of Sita, which is the story of Sita from Sita and Ram, in which I was a servant, and I said to myself, was I that servant, or was I channeling that servant? It didn't matter. I became that servant. I had the experience of that servant. I don't know if I was actually that servant, but I became that servant. And so you can align yourself and experience that. So in the ultimate sense, we are it all, but we don't I mean, honestly, we don't live with that ultimate realization until we have cosmic consciousness. Now we live with the limited frame. And in the limited frame, this was my history. You've really laid it out very, very clearly. But let me ask, let me ask you this. Uh, for viewers who, who say, I wish I could be like Dina, I wish I could remember my past life so clearly. And, and for example, myself, I don't have any clear memories of any past lives. I get little flashes here and there, and that, that's about it. Is it advisable to pursue those memories? I think a little while back you said you don't need to bother with that. You don't. I mean, I, I remember early on when I started meditating, there'd be people that I knew who would be having these wild experiences, meditation and seeing lights and traveling out of their body. And I didn't have any of that. 
And of course, in my tradition, you, you don't you don't look at what another person has. You know, you you, you just you, you know it it so you don't you don't divulge them. You don't talk about it. And I, for a long time, I didn't. As I said, I wasn't initially going to publish this, and I thought maybe there's some value there. But I think that everybody has a different experience, and some people. You know, all have all kinds of spiritual experiences in meditation. This happens to be what's come to me, and I think there's a purpose purpose f- f- to it because I think now it's time it's time for us to enlarge our sense of who we are uh, and 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 overcome our um, you know. I mean, how would it change behavior if we knew that we I've been a king, I've been a queen, I've been a peasant, I've been a slave, I've been a slave master. It changes your perspective. And I could go on and on about experiences that I've had that have ha- that have changed my perspective. But just knowing that that's true is enough. And just knowing that death is just a transition to another way of being, most people would say is better. Maybe not better for everyone, but for most of us, yes will help people uh get over this this fear of death. I mean, you know, it's it's I think I think that we're at an evolutionary inflection now as a human species where we have to enlarge our sense of of who we are and yet not think ourselves as the center of the universe as we do, but know that we're part of this much larger whole and just you know, we're 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 part of the whole we're connected to the whole. Everything is connected to everything else. We're not separate, and yet we're not. We're not. We're not. Um, you know, the dominant force in the universe or on Earth. <laughs> well, Dina, Miriam, this has been a delightful conversation. I feel very honored to meet you. I will encourage our viewers to check out your books. I think the key in your books isn't just that you're uh, writing as a historian and reporting these past lives and the cultural context. It's that there are deep spiritual lessons that you present in each of those past lives. To me, that's the value of the books you've written. That's my hope. Is that is that whether people believe you know the, the, all the details of the story, if they can get the lessons um, that came to me, then that's that's my hope. They're wonderful books. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to talk to you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.